Well, welcome this morning, and thank you uh, for inviting me to this conference. Um, the title of this talk this morning is, Think You Need Help, Now What? And I'm going to leave it to you to guess who I'm speaking about, but a wise panel member said, when you start talking, you start the dialogue. So we get to start the dialogue this morning. Welcome, and maybe we'll start from your far left, uh, and uh, perhaps you could introduce yourselves each and provide a, a little summary for the audience, a little bit about you. Hi, everyone. My name is Carrie Fiorillo, and uh, I have been in recovery for, I got sober in January of 2011, and uh, since then, I was, I was a cocaine addict, crack addict, and uh, alcoholic, and since then, I've become a criminal lawyer, and that is my story. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Alicia. Um, I live with anxiety and depression, and I have attempted to take my own life um, when I was 13. Um, I Right now, I just try to use my story to help inspire other young people to see that recovery is possible and that anything is possible for people who have live, who are living with or have lived with mental illness. Um, I've done over 600 speeches and I get to hear so many amazing stories in return. And uh, right now I'm, contrib I'm a contributor for both the Huffington Post and the Mighty. Hey, good morning everyone. My name is Jesse Hansen and uh, co-founder of a place called Helix Healthcare Group and most Canadians think I'm crazy to have left California to come here. It's probably partially true. It has nothing uh, to do with leaving California. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, I, I'm honored to be here and grateful to be here. And in, in short, uh, I do have my own past about 15 years ago with substance abuse. And more importantly for me, just living in a very uh, dark, dark mentality, dark attitude about the world. And it was through my own healing journey that helped me realize and actualize what what has now become Helix. And in short, we really, we help people get to the, the root causes, the root issues as to why addictions or mental health challenges exist. And rather than sticking too tightly to the simple diagnostic criteria, we really look at the, the symptoms that are driving that diagnosis and help people unfurl those from where, where the roots are. And uh, honored again to be here. My name is Andrew Galloway. I'm a recovering crack cocaine addict myself. I'm national director for a company called Edgewood Health Network. We have over 150 inpatient beds across Canada, including Edgewood and Bellwood Health Services here in Toronto, with also seven or eight outpatient offices spread across the country. I'm also a counselor for the National Hockey League and Major League Soccer Substance Abuse and Behavior Health Programs, and I do the television show Intervention. I think that's it in a nutshell. So you, you think you need help, now what? We're going to have a series of questions that we're going to run through and ask the panelists to speak to, and at the end there'll be an opportunity to ask questions and add to that. Uh, depending on time, I may solicit the audience to provide your expertise and feedback on the question. Uh, I don't know that I'll be able to, but I will try based on time. So if you have a burning answer to the question, I may try and solicit that as well along the way. So the first question I'd like to start off with is, how do you decide if you need help? And again, maybe anybody can pipe in, but I'd like everybody if you'd like to speak to the topic to uh, just follow in turn. Well, um, I'll start first. So for a really long time, I was in complete denial that I needed help. Um, I'm the daughter of two amazingly strong people. My father's a veteran and my mom raised her brothers and sisters by herself. And to wake up every day and to know that they've had really hard lives and that they've given up so much, but here I am, this spoiled kid who still can't get out of bed, was really hard for me. And it took me a long time to realize what I was living with was not, like was an illness and was something that I deserved help for. Um, I knew I needed help when I, uh, like unfortunately, when I woke up in a hospital bed. And when I, uh, when I was so gone that I thought that my family and my friends would be better off with me not here because then they wouldn't have to take care of me. And so that's kind of that journey I had there. And for me, one of the things that 
happened even after that was it still took me probably about seven years from that incident to reach out for help in person. I was talking to a lot of people online, a lot of support groups online, but to actually deal with the stigma of going somewhere in person took me a, a really long time. Also, just a quick note, um, I do have to leave a little early, so I, if, I, if you see me leaving, I'm, I'm, I'm okay, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'll, uh, I'll follow up with you, and thank you for your personal sharing there. And what I thought of as you, I heard you speak was that there's definitely the, the cases that are more overt, such as waking up in a hospital bed um, or an overdose of any sort, wherever it leads us, or extreme sort of bottoms, uh, as they're often called. And I completely agree with you. That is a very loud neon red flag of, yes, I need help now. Uh, I also want to speak to, and I think there's a lot of people in our society that need help that are not at that bottom, aren't waking up in hospital beds, that are just dealing with a lot of uh, grief, sadness, anxiety, a number of other things like that, that could either be feeding an active addiction or precursors to an addictive onset or a mental health challenge. And so one of the, the questions that I often ask you know, my clients and I've had to ask myself a lot is quality of life. What is, what is my current quality of life? And, and uh, to Bill's point earlier, am I, am I really happy with who this version of me is? And I would make the argument that never, not to say that it has to be as an extreme or as an intensive intervention or program, but any of us that can just be honest with ourselves and say, you know what, I think I'm not really living up to my, my full potential. I know that I still really never dealt with that childhood stuff, even if I'm not actively abusing anything, a substance that has to be being compensated for in some way. And so the, the humbleness and the inner honesty of any maladaptive behaviors and thought patterns would also be an indication of, of seeking some kind of mental health support. And I'd love to have anyone in this room help transfer that awareness. I, I feel I daily experience both with my clients and in just the life in general that that's something that we're facing right now as a culture that as long as we're making money and as long as we're getting through the day and it looks good on Facebook, that then we don't need help. But the truth is, I mean, just go back in human history, not even that far, <laughs> support and mental health and even to go back to ancient ancient times you know the 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 shamans or the healers of those cultures knew that it was a part of the daily culture and the and the part of their life and and there's still indigenous people here in canada that that know that and that mental health was actually more of a priority back then and we've sort of squashed it to as long as you're not your crap's not hitting the fan you're good just keep taking another xanax and get in there in the office and make that money and you know, I just wanted to ruffle those tail feathers of, of everyone in here and, and those that aren't here too, because I think that there's a big piece that is just starting to be uncovered. So that's another way I would ask us to notice, do we need help or do our loved ones need help? Um, yeah, I agree with everything that Jesse said, so, but uh, I guess I'll add, you know, for, for myself, you know, I, I had a, a few seizures and that was a pretty good wake-up call, the fact that 20 minutes after having a seizure, my brain said, well, that didn't kill me, I can do a little bit more. But, you know, when I look at, uh, and I'm going to use terms like alcoholic and addict, and I don't mean to offend anyone by using those words, because uh, it's really clinical, but, you know, <clears throat> when we have, you know, I guess I look at the difference between an abuser and an alcoholic, or an abuser and an addict, and... An abuser may drink twice as much, twice as often as someone that has a, has a problem. But when they recognize that they have a problem, they're actually able to make the changes necessary. But an alcoholic or an addict will have the best intentions in the world and then wake up the next day and it'll all change. Five o'clock will come along, that first beer will be drank, and then they're on their way. Which is what happened for me. I probably went a year and a half saying, that's it, I'm done, finished, it's over. Thank you. 
also down to you know consequences. When you start to recognize that your friends are friends are no longer around, your family's distancing yourself, and you're isolating. You know, alcoholism and, and addiction is an isolating illness or disease or disorder, whatever you want to call it. You know, we end up alone for the most part. And, and when we get to that place, well, hopefully long before you get to that place. But when we get to that place, and you're filled with shame and you're filled with guilt. Um, you know, the hardest thing to do is to reach out and ask for help. And, and thank God, you know, in our society today with a lot, of the, a lot of the work, you know, places like Edgewood Health Network, Healthy Minds, Bell Cannon stuff, we're trying to change the stigma of addiction and mental health and making it okay to put your hand up and say, I need some help. But that's probably the hardest part of, of change is, is that willingness to want to change. And, you know, that, that, the number one factor in change is actually willingness, being able to say, I need help. <laughs> So uh, I was always willing to get help for mental illness. I've been seeing a psychiatrist since I was 14. So in some ways, I recognized that there was something wrong, not working about um, me, my behaviors, etc. But when it came to substance abuse, substance use, um, for me, and I think I, if there was something that I knew, if I could have known earlier, if I could have had this demonstrated to me, but maybe I could only have learned through my own personal experience, but I kept waiting for a set of external circumstances to happen that were so bad that I would recognize, like the, the proverbial wake-up call. The thing is, I never had a wake-up call. I never experienced a wake-up call. Every time I was in the hospital, I was like, Meh. Like it doesn't, it never set in that it was, because I don't know if it was my tolerance for, for the pain that I was in was so high, my ability to live in discomfort was so high. Like I never, the amount of times I walked out of Cam H and into the comfort zone, or like walked out of Mount Sinai and called my drug dealer. Like it just, I don't know, I was constantly in the hospital and constantly being committed against my will, um, often actually, and, and, uh, and it never did anything that it was supposed to do because the, the the discomfort, the recognition that I needed help had to come from something internal. I had to be more uncomfortable than I was comfortable with my discomfort, if that makes any sense. And it wasn't until I was so tapped out of ideas and I was so in such spiritual discomfort um, where I had no ideas left and I had nowhere else to go and I'd been to a billion treatment centers and I'd done everything that they had suggested, but it wasn't until I was so out of ideas that I was able to recognize that, that there was a real problem here because nothing on earth seemed to be able to fix it. Um, nothing that I changed externally seemed to matter and nothing that happened externally seemed to change my behavior. So I suggest to people the idea of being alive to their discomfort. That's the only way that I sort of um, got to a place that I was, and maybe other people can avoid going that far down to the point that they have exhausted every possible external resource. I think what I've heard from this is that a certain level of self-awareness and acceptance of the need for help seems to be a common theme for everybody. And that for many, there's a delay between the initial inklings that there's a problem and I need help and active participation or engagement. And hopefully what we'll learn from some of this conference will be uh, how do we close that gap. Two possible barriers to that are denial and stigma. Stigma both of the condition itself, but also of accepting help. And I'm going to throw into that as well self-stigma, which I actually see as something that is ironically uh, often a big part of the picture. Any comments on uh, the, sort of these delays or denial stigma and self-stigma? I have a comment about uh, self-stigma, just really briefly. Um, a funny story that I like to tell is when I was in active addiction and... Uh, People would suggest to me that I was an addict, but I was so offended by that term because I thought that I was, um, I thought that I was able to change anything. I thought that I was powerful enough to be able to change anything about myself. And I thought that addict using was a choice. That's what I like to call it. It was a choice to be self-destructive. And I went so far as to buy, I went to the Indigo at uh, Bay and Bloor and I bought a book called Addiction is a Choice. And it was the book that I would put on my bookshelf. And then when I was doing drugs with my friends, I would bring that book out and we would do drugs on that book. And it was like this symbolic sort of like, see, like I know what I'm doing and I'm doing it on purpose. So I, I don't know, to me that indicates 
you know, just how strongly I was attached to this idea, and I think our society constantly reinforces it, that I make the decision, I'm in control, and if you don't like what I'm doing, you can not look. Um, but, yeah, that's my self-stigma story. Um, I think... I think the, so how I kind of got over some of the net denial about what I was going through um, was I think I can mirror some of these stories here to say that um, when it was just me, when I was the only one having the problem, like I could, okay, there, well, <laughs> um, I could hide it, I could be in denial, but um, when I was 18, uh, I lost four friends to suicide in one year. And I sat at the fourth funeral not knowing if it was going to be the last one and just, and just saying to myself, like, maybe, maybe if I was honest and verbal with what I was going through, this wouldn't have happened. And it took something that was external to me that was other people suffering for me to wake up and live a life that was more authentic to myself. But I see self-stigma all the time. I see a lot of young people buying into the idea that, oh, because I'm self-harming, I'm, I'm, you know, I just want attention, and oh, like I don't want to put my story out there because, like, I don't want people to to know that I'm vulnerable or to know that I need attention. And and when they have had illness, you know, they say things like, well, I have to just learn to expect less of myself. Um, and that's not true. I mean, you have so many amazing people on this panel. You saw Sophie Trudeau. Everything is possible for somebody, um, no matter what they've gone through. And I think until you can actually talk to somebody else with the lived experience, until you have those role models in your life of people who have recovered, you may not know that. Um, I So when I was hospitalized, I was 13. I was a pain in the ass to every <laughs> doctor and clinician and nurse that was there. The only person who got through to me was actually um, a client who was also in the treatment center with me. And she um, was staring at me for a really long time in like the creepy late night subway way. And... <laughs> And like she eventually like approached me and she put this like piece of jewelry in my hand and she said from one crazy person to another you'll need this. And then she wandered off and I remember looking in my hand and seeing this like uh, jewelry, piece of jewelry that just was very simple and just had a single uh, like uh, piece, piece on it that said hope. And um, even though this lady was sick, even though this lady um, was dealing with mania and not fully in control of giving away her stuff. She saw that there was this young kid there that needed help, and she helped me. And she was the reason I started talking to people and reaching out, because hiding feels like it's so much easier. It feels like you don't have to talk to people about it all the time, and you don't have to deal with their stigma and their questions. I mean, I've had people ask me everything from like intimate details about what my parents did wrong to don't you know people are scared of you? And, and, and like it's sometimes it can feel so much easier to deal with it inside to hide, but I also know that half the reason why I thought suicide was my answer was because I was hiding because I couldn't deal with hiding anymore. I want to speak for just a couple of minutes about the correlations that I'm seeing as I'm listening to stigma, self-stigma, and denial, and just kind of feeling it's a, it's a challenging triangle, and self-fulfilling, and self-feeding, and imagining back to uh, how this could have happened, right? And seeing it as self-stigmas, or fears in that way, denials in that way, birthing a cultural stigma, right? A culture that would stigmatize getting help. and. Now, like you mentioned, Sophie Trudeau, and, and there is more and more movements in this conference as an example of it, there's more and more people waking up to say, this stigma is actually hurting us. It's actually keeping us in a more limited way of being. And so I just, I just want to bring our awareness to that, of noticing how it could start from a, a number of individual minds that could influence a greater culture. And now the uh, crossroads we're at, and hopefully the lifting of a curse in a way, is that a cultural paradigm shift's happening and the more and more that there are individual people that are willing to relieve themselves of their self-stigmas, the more the cultural shift happens and synergistically, the more that 
the cultural stigma starts to shift, that it becomes easier to lift the self-stigma. And I really just see denial as almost a byproduct of, of all of this. And a, it's like, oh, because there's all this stigma, it's easier if I just deny this. And there's a lot of uh, mechanisms built into culture to make it easy to, to stay in denial, right? Not just through substance abuse, but many other ways as well. So, you know, and, and again, I, I will try not to reference California every time, but I, I do miss it, I admit. But, you know, in the culture, and I admit California is in a way a, a country into of itself, and this by no means represents the masses of America, as you guys know. Uh, but, you know, the culture that I left to, to come here is like, if you ain't in therapy, you ain't cool. Like, what are you thinking, you know? And it, it's starting to birth. I've been in Canada now for two years, and I, I really do love the culture here. Mm -hmm. And I find that there's, especially in Toronto, it's like a readiness for this and just needing some type of guidance, some type of leadership towards, you know, panels like this, for example, and, and the speech that Sophie gave and ways of saying, hey, it's okay to come out of that little box. It's okay to talk about your stuff. And so it's really exciting and an honor and I'm starting to feel, I, and I, I truly mean this, is that the energy I'm experiencing in Toronto right now is very similar to what I experienced in Los Angeles about 17 years ago when this kind of a movement was, was happening there as well. So I, I, I bring a message of hope and I know we've got a long hill to climb uh, but I do notice it's happening, and you know, if you ain't cool, you ain't in, ain't in therapy. So, you know, um, just just hold that with us as we keep going through our days, and hopefully re release the self stigmas. Uh, I guess that makes us really cool. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, you know, it, it's the only disorder that tells us that we don't have it. You know, if, if you get diagnosed with cancer, you may go get a second opinion and that person will say, yes, you have cancer, you need to be in chemotherapy, you need to start tomorrow. And we're there tomorrow at 9 a.m. and we're there every morning at 9 a.m. getting chemo treatment. You tell someone with a substance use disorder that they have an issue or, or that's the diagnosis, they go, well, I'm not really sure. You know, there's that denial part. And they aren't willing, or a lot of them aren't willing to do what it takes to, to make the change necessary. Because putting recovery at the, at the top of the list is really important. It's not something you can do in a haphazard way. The other problem with the, talking about denial, though, is someone who doesn't have a problem is going to deny it. <laughs> right? For instance, like, you know, it's a little embarrassing self-story, but last week my, uh, my girlfriend came to me and, and said, how much pornography are you watching? Uh, and I, you know, I was like, I actually haven't watched any pornography in a long time, honey. She's like, why are you lying? And I'm like, I, I'm not lying. I haven't watched any pornography at all, I promise. And not that she would care if I did once in a while, but, you know, she was like, you're watching it every day. And I'm like, no, I'm not watching it, I promise. And, you know, finally went, you know, and you're watching teenagers. And I'm like, I'm not watching teens. And, uh, you know, it turned out to be my 11-year-old son who had discovered the, <laughs> the uh, you know, had Googled a bad word and suddenly, you know, I don't think he was actually looking for teenage girls online, but, you know, had, had to be honest, he Googled the word shit and that had brought up pornography and then next thing you know, he was tapping on it, learning about sex um, the wrong way. Um, so that was an interesting conversation later with my child. But, you know, there she's like, you know, you're denying it. That's part of addiction. You know, da, 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 da. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. So, you know, we do have to be a little careful uh, and, and have our facts straight. Um, you know, and, and then we, we mentioned shame, and so I'll talk a little bit about shame. You know, when I, when I look at the, the hardest people in my office to, to help change are the wealthiest, most educated, and younger people. Because all of those three tell us that we are capable of handling this situation. We don't have the same consequences. Give me a 50-year-old, divorced, you know, broke, unemployed man, He'll listen, he'll do anything. He is, he'll, he's sober or he's on the path to recovery very quickly. Give me a 25 year old university educated guy making 100 grand a year. You know, he has that idea that I can conquer everything. I've been able to handle whatever I need to in my life and there is no way that some substance or alcohol is gonna take me down. And, and that's the most challenging part. You know, he, he is, they are unwilling to see it. Even though they may be filled with some shame, they may be filled with that, they admitting it to someone else, but is really difficult for them. But admitting to themselves is even harder. 
You know, that, I mean, I really find that uh, you know those those clients are are the hardest ones to to, to help. Um, you know, and and you know when I look back on my own journey. You know, the, the idea that, you know, I grew up in a very nice house and a great family and a loving place and, you know, how could I have a problem? Like, there's just, I felt guilty for the fact that I had developed a disorder. You know, I felt, I was full of shame that someone had had all these opportunities in front of them, had a life, you know, of, could do anything they wanted, never lacked for education, never lacked for food, beautiful, you know, great family life. How could I be the one struggling? I was embarrassed by the fact that, that, you know, gee, someone that had no opportunity and had a hard life, I could see they turned it to drugs. But, but you know, someone like me, there's no way. Um, and that took a long time for me to get to a place, you know, like having seizures, having severe consequences before I finally went, wow, you know, maybe, maybe I'm wrong here. <laughs> um, I'm going to piggyback on that really quick because that's such a great point, Andrew, that, you know, it's, again, to, to your initial check-in, like, when you wake up in a hospital bed, it's, it's kind of hard to, to not to deny anymore, but when you've got a good enough upbringing and you've got money and you've got a successful-looking life, and so one of the, the main lenses that, that we work with at Helix is around attachment trauma, and attachment trauma is a relatively new thing in the field, but it's, it's acute trauma is what everyone thinks of as trauma, which is the physical sexual assaults, car wrecks, and war vets, and things like that, but... Attachment trauma is what I would probably qualify guys like you and I in of, you know, we had very good enough upbringings, but there's no perfect parents out there. And no matter how good a job you do, you're going to miss something. And that emotional misattunement or that not getting the right teaching in the right moment that was really needed, or in my case, a father who did not know how to bring any type of emotionality or, or kind of bringing up into adolescence and manhood, that's where I really know that my roots of my addictive patterns lie. And so I just want to name that because it is so important in that, you know, I say that's the, the tougher nut to crack because there's so much easier denial when you've got, and also especially if there is affluence involved, it's like, wow, I can kind of, I can afford, if I, something bad happens, I can afford, I'll pay, I'll pay the best doctor in the world to fix me up or whatever it is. And so th there are just so many, so many facets that contribute to this and this pattern of denial and stigma and, Really excited that you know the field itself is is waking up to attachment trauma, the emotional wounding that really makes a person susceptible to fall into addictive and destructive behavior patterns, whether those patterns have to do with substances or pornography or shopping or just uh, general disassociation, right? Leaving, not knowing how to stay present. So thank you. That's it for reminding me about that. I just wanted to add something as well on a, on a positive note. So when I got sober in January 2011, I had no idea what I was going to do. I, I fell back just like we're talking about affluence, et cetera, and I fell back on a really good education. I had a BA and I had an MA. And uh, I decided that I would go and uh, try to get into law school because that's a great fallback career. And um, that was supposed to be funny. <laughs> but, um, it it so was fun. <laughs> thanks. Um, so. What ended up happening is I applied to law school and I decided to write my, op my entrance essay on, on recovery. And I decided when I got in, I said, I can either like compartmentalize and sort of, I'm in a 12 step fellowship, I can do that at night and I can have sponsees and I can do whatever, I have a sponsor, have sponsees and all that stuff, and then go to law school and pretend that I'm not that or at least not acknowledge it. Or um, I can decide to be completely holistic, even though I wouldn't, use that term necessarily, but anyway, I just decided, you know, to hell with it. What, what do I have to hide anyway? This is like, I'm only sober since 2011, so I'm basically like two years old. This is my chance to be totally authentic. So just on a positive note about stigma, I did, I was, I came out of the closet. I was totally open at school. I'm totally open in my career. I'm totally open with the company that I work for. And the funny thing that happened is I feel like so, uh, I don't have to be somebody different from nine to five or whatever and then somebody different at night. And uh, I've had the most positive reception. Like I wrote an article in Toronto Life, I came totally, totally out. And then, uh, and people have come to me with their, their issues, right? And it says um, in, in the book that my fellowship considers the basic text, it basically suggests that no matter how far down the scale we've gone, our experience can help others. And that I find so true, right? And there's something really nice about being able to um, take back 
like to, to destigmatize on a personal level. I don't have to wait for any broader societal changes. No, I'm gonna do it for myself, you know, regardless of what anybody thinks. And I wouldn't have cared had the consequences been negative. I really wouldn't have. Um, because if it wasn't gonna make sense for me in the entirety of who I am, then I don't, then I don't need it, to be honest, so. And I just wanted to add one uh, last thing on this. And um, I have, uh, I'm from a family where I was the first person to ever graduate from university. My father uh, left school when he was seven because they let him do that for some reason. And my mom finished her high school in night school, um, barely speaking a word of English. And like I felt a lot of need to um, to deny it, and a lot of kids of my background, um, I don't look it, but I'm Portuguese. We have really low graduation rates, really low literacy rates, really low across the board, and and, and no one really knows it be because you know we we look white, and white kids don't get those. Nobody talks about that. But I I remember just really feeling like I didn't want to give in to the stereotypes, like. I had I have 16 cousins and a bunch of them were kicked out of school were involved with um, gangs and, and the mafia and and knowing that everybody had already given up on me um, and that made it actually really hard once I started to show that I was recovered and and put my story out there it made it really hard to be sick again because I was all of a sudden people were holding me up as a beacon of hope and this idea that this could happen, that when I started to falter again and feel sick again, um, I was so scared of losing my voice. I was so scared to admit it to anyone because I could see the doctors and people in mental health I was working with totally dismiss somebody because they thought they were still sick. To say that they, you know, to even people in the field and not assuming that you can be sick and still have a valid criticism of something. Um, and so it was really hard to, I, I kind of sh explain it as being addicted to being well, to being that perfect picture of recovery, to never faltering. And it was because some of my background and, and not wanting to be the stereotypes that had surrounded me my whole life. And it ended up really hurting me and really putting me in a place where I was even worse off than I was when I started this journey. And I really want to, to speak to, to folks to say that, you know, there's, there's a lot of communities that don't have education, that don't have money. It doesn't make this journey easier for them. A lot of people just, you know, oh, okay, it's expected that you're going to be sad. It's expected all of these things. And, and they have to deal with so many other layers of, of racism, of classism, of, you know, discrimination of all kinds on top of this, and I think it's important to really call that out as well. So uh, let's move on to the question, what do you do if someone you care for needs help? And I think we've heard a lot about denial, so let's add to that, needs help, but it has an element of denial. I think that's probably a topical question for almost every single person in this room. Um, okay, I'm gonna start out with the unpopular opinion. Um, <laughs> that most people probably won't agree with, but I, so the other night, um, my husband and I, he's also here and he's a panelist later, and we were fielding a phone call from a friend of ours who was essentially trying to force somebody into detox. And he, the person he was trying to help was in psychosis, and I am very familiar with psychosis, having spent the last you know, four years of my addiction, basically totally delusional, and, uh, and, and constantly in psych wards. And for me, and this is just my experience, um, I, I basically believe in letting people fall. And I know that that's not popular and it's not whatever, but I think that you can only put the tools in front of them. There's the saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. I, I've done 12 step calls that have been successful where I've gone and I've told my story and that's as far as I'm willing to go. I'm willing to meet them wherever they are, tell my story, do what it takes um, in, that, in that sense, share my experience, but I am not of the mind uh, that I 
I don't believe in coercing. Um, that's me personally because it never worked with me and that's just the experience that I have. But I know that other people have different experiences and maybe they had um, people coerce them and then ultimately they came to terms with their, their situation. I was very rebellious, so if anything, any type of uh, intervention per se and pushed me in a direction like where I felt like I would say, um, you know what, just because you think that I'm unwell, I'm going to be so unwell <laughs> that you're not gonna believe it, right? Which is so counterproductive, but that's the nature of who I was, right? So there are some people for whom that works, but for me, um, I, I had to fall on my own. Um, so I moderate a bunch of communities online. I see a lot of people who um, are comfortable with sharing their story in one modality, and I get a lot of a lot of people finding me on social media or other places online, or ending up in the comment sections of my article, who are asking me that question about I'm you know I'm watching uh, I'm watching my friends slip away, and I don't know what to do, and I don't know how to help. And it's scary. Um, I have a, a poem that I, I share called The Definition of Crazy. And there's a line in it that, that talks about feeling like, as a friend or a family member, someone with mental illness, you feel like you're the cupped hands and they're the water. And no matter how much you try to keep the water in your hands, it feels like they're slipping away. And I think I can understand that being so incredibly hard. But that's why I think it's really important to to sit there, to listen to what they're saying, um, to sometimes make the hard call and be the bad guy and get them the help that they need, but also not always jumping to putting them in the hospital or uh, mm -hmm. jumping to the way that you recovered or the way that you think will work um, and really listening to them and asking them how they want to get better and giving them some of that control. I think is really important. I have a lot of, um, I get a lot of messages from it, from family members, from moms specifically, who want their kids to get better in a particular way. And I think with this message, it's that whatever's gonna help them is gonna help them. And you have to try a million different things. And even if you have lived experience, what worked for you may not work for somebody else. So really just being there for them and encouraging them to take this journey. It may not be linear and it's definitely not gonna be fun. Um, but it's definitely a worth, uh, a journey worth taking. Uh, in that same poem that I wrote called The Definition of Crazy, um, one of the things that I think we all have to recognize is that when we think about crazy, there's a children's rhyme that says crazy is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting the same result. Um, the only place in the world that does the same thing over and over again in the mental health system and expects the same result is the mental health system. <laughs> <laughs> None, nobody I know who has supported somebody living with mental illness or addiction or has been a person living with mental illness or addiction like can do the same things over and over again expecting the same result. There's an urgency, there's a need for something different, something that works, something to take the pain away. And I think it's really important to respect that. Um, there's, a, there's a line from an internet personality that says, do whatever you need to to stay alive and work towards something healthy and sustainable. If you're supporting someone, sometimes the things they're gonna do to stay alive may not make sense to you, may be harmful, but try to recognize it as they're doing something to keep themselves here and help support them to get to something that's healthy and sustainable and that works for them. Beautiful. I really resonate with what you just said and, and especially in the idea that it's all we, it, each situation is so individualized and insanity or craziness, doing the same thing over and over again and thinking you're gonna get different results. <clears throat> so a couple ideas I wanted to share with you guys is that uh, one, I, I do my best whenever I'm working with someone to help them get support that they need to remember that the part that I'm really frustrated at or that I'm like, God, oh, if you just would stop doing that, if you stop drinking, if you stop using, but to realize that is a symptom of deep underlying pain. And if all I do is see the symptom and talk to the symptom, guess what I'm doing? What you described. I'm pushing them further into the symptoms. And so I always say to, to remember to, to speak through the symptom, to speak into the pain, to speak into that part 
that is hurting and wounded. And especially with more intense and severe addictions, that's often the inner child. And I don't mean to say, oh, goo goo gaga, come here. But to say, to remember, this is, especially if we know them and we know what's happened, to be sensitive to that and to speak through the symptom into the pain. Um, th the other point to echo a bit of what you were saying is that, you know, it, it really, it, presence, I think presence is so important to, to not come in with too strong of an agenda or too strong of like, okay, this is what we're going to do, this is what we're going to say, and this is how it's going to be, but to really notice how each sentence and each word even and each place of presence that a loved one brings to another loved one that's hurting really does impact that moment-to-moment -moment experience that ultimately will greatly influence the outcome of that conversation. And to that point, oftentimes if I get calls from parents that know their kid needs help and they want to get them in and they're so frustrated they want it, I'm like, it's now or never and I'm drawing the line and da-da-da-da. You know, obviously that's their personal, edit. and again, each situation, I don't have a black and white answer as to kick your kid out or not, or cut them off or not, but I will often invite the parent or parents or loved ones in to start doing their own work on themselves and their anxiety and their fears. And oftentimes in that model, again, it's not always so linear, we can't control the timing of it, but it's like, okay, this is definitely a family systems issue, even though there's one person that's carrying the pain of the family. If, if the other family members are the ones that are actually calling me or willing to get help, come on in. And once they start to wake up more and learn more adaptive information to learn how to relate to that person, it's much more likely and more effective and more expedited in terms of getting that person who's holding the pain in the family system to really come and get the help they need. So to really, as, as an interventionist, whether you're a formal interventionist or a just pulling it off because you care about someone, to realize, whoa, I'm part of this too. And maybe I'm not carrying the majority of the imbalances or the dysfunctions, but I, I am somehow influencing this. And if I can own that, if I can start to really see that for myself, I'll be able to relate to them in a new way that greatly increases the chance. And last point to echo again, you, I think you nailed it, is that, that piece about, you know, even though it can be making us crazy as the loved one who wants them to get help, it's like they are doing everything they can to stay on this planet. And to come at them at, at an attack just pushes them further away. And to realize even though it's a, a really awful coping mechanism, it's the best one they know how right now. And to keep working towards baby steps is often more... Uh, applicable than that radical, I don't remember how you guys described it, but like I'm going to become super recovery person and overnight, you know, to realize this is going to be a process. So to, to have a family system that can also hold that awareness that this is going to be a journey and the more the family can be not blaming and I call it the identified patient syndrome and it's a family sickness, a family uh, lack of awareness and that to help realize, wow, this is all of us in this together really does move the ball forward, in my experience. Yeah, and it's, and it's usually the ones that's suffering the most that doesn't realize that it's all of you in it together and that, is, that are suffering. I think there's a common misconception that interventions, and, and obviously I'm a fan of them. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I, I think we have to, to realize a couple things. One, you know, letting someone hit bottom. Bottom is dead. <laughs> You know, majority of people struggling with addictions, you know, and I, know I can only speak about addictions, uh, end up dead. You know, that, that, that's, that's the end result. You know, so, you know, I would say to family members, we, let's not wait till then. The other misconception about interventions is that it's actually for the ones struggling with addictions. It's as much for the family as it is for the person struggling. Because the family sits back, is, has tried in different ways, and I always say interventions are a last resort. If you haven't tried everything else, do not try an intervention. But as a last resort to come in a loving and caring way and say, hey, look, you know, we love you. We want you in our lives, but here's how, you're, you know, here's how your behavior is affecting us. 
we're in pain. This, you know, most of us, and I, you know, I'll speak for myself, I had no idea the impact I was having on my friends, my lover, my family. I thought I was only hurting me, don't worry about it, leave me alone. And that wasn't the case. And a lot of people that are struggling with addictions do not understand that it is affecting all of those around them. And we all have a right to be happy. <laughs> to live a good life. So an intervention is really about delivering a message of we love you, we care about you, we like things to change, we're hurting too, how can we support you? You know, 90% of people that are intervened upon end up going to treatment. You know, and they have the same success rates as someone who puts their hand up and says, I want help on their own. Granted, 10% don't, without question. And the majority of those 10 end up dead. Right? There are those that may turn it down and, and go through some more stuff and, and fall, you know, fall deeper and deeper into their illness or sickness and then you know, recognize, I need to make a change. Great. Maybe that seed was planted that day they did that, that intervention and they told everyone to go to hell. A seed may have been planted. may have taken a couple of years for that tree to grow, but it might have been planted. You know, and... Uh, <clears throat> You know, it's, it's, it's hard for families, it's hard for loved ones to sit back and, and, you know, allow someone to be on their journey. I agree, you know, I'm the first one these days, and I lead a pretty spiritual life to say we're all on our own journey, you know, go it. But with someone who's struggling, who may not be aware of, of the impact they're having, not only on themselves, but everyone around them, I like to look as, as I'm just going to use the word addict, and I, I'm not a big fan of labels and stuff, but just easier than using all the clinical terms. <laughs> so, you know, is, is we all think we're doing okay. We're out in the middle of the lake. We're great swimmers. We're treading water. And, we're, and you know, family members are going by, by in rowboats and, and saying, here, grab on. Come on. I'm like, oh, I'm okay. Don't worry. I'm a professional swimmer. You know, no, go. Come on. Come on. No. And majority of people won't actually ask for the help until they go underwater and start drowning. And sort of interventions to some degree speed that process up. If a person turns it down, most likely they will start to spiral after an intervention, start to drown, and get to a place where they're either going to die or be willing to make a change. Boom. <laughs> um, I think one of the things... One of the things that's really important here for people who are supporting people with mental health issues is to not take it all on yourself. So I get a lot of young kids who, my friend will only talk to me, they won't talk to anyone, they're not interested in talking to a doctor, but I'm, being kept, I'm awake till 6 a.m. every day talking to them on Facebook or I get messages from them every odd hour, or I see tweets from them in the middle of the night that are very concerning, but they won't talk to anyone, they'll just talk to me. And I have, um, I'm, I'm a trained lifeguard, and one of the first things they teach you is that um, if somebody's drowning, you have to give them a flotation device. If they, even if you're the strongest swimmer in the world, if they grab onto you, they could take you down with them. And I think it's really important for folks who are supporting people is that to make sure that you are, in whenever possible, figuring out ways for that, that person to care for themselves, to learn how to, to do it on themselves, but also take care of yourself, have your barriers, have some time for you to care, because listening to somebody be in that much pain for so long, it does take an effect on you. It, it will get, like hurt you and... So many people, parents and family members and friends, end up being the only support for somebody. And it's just so hard and so unsustainable. So it's really important to not feel selfish about taking that time for yourself and taking care of yourself. That's really important um, to not try to burn yourself out in the process. I mean, it's, I, I totally agree. And, and you know, this, when I was saying it affects everybody, you know, when I look at the Edgewood Health Network and the, at Edgewood and Bellwood, there's both inpatient, you know, we have inpatients, we have family programs that last a week. In our outpatient offices, we have intensive outpatient programs for family members. We have as many people in that program as we do in the program for those that are actually struggling so that they get the help, they get the support, and they also get the knowledge of what's actually happening to their loved one. You know, because a lot of times, you know, majority of people go, God, why can't you just change? Why can't you just stop using? Oh, well, thanks, Mom. That, 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 that helps. Uh, <laughs> that made me feel better. You know, like, you know, they end up shaming the person to such a degree that, you know, and the only one per way I knew how to deal with shame was to use more. You know, it's a vicious cycle. I don't know if you've ever read the book The Little Prince uh, by Jean-Paul Sartre. It's, uh, there's a one-page um, 
story in there that the little prince uh, arrives on the world of the drunkard and there's a man sitting at a table and there's bottles all around and he goes up and goes, what are you doing? I'm drinking. Why are you drinking? I'm ashamed. Why are you ashamed of my drinking? The little prince is like, what? And flies off to another world. Mm -hmm. It's a great example of, you know, how do you break that cycle? You know, I, I think back to myself. You know, I, I showed up for work every day. I never missed a day of work. I wor worked till 3 o'clock because I lived in Vancouver, so I was on Toronto time. I went home. I started drinking. I started freebasing cocaine. At 11 o'clock, I said I got to go to bed because I got to be at work. I thought I was in control because I could put the crack cocaine down at 11 o'clock at night. This went on for years, except for the problem was I wouldn't brush my teeth in the, at the sink because there was a mirror there. You know, I brushed my teeth in the shower. <laughs> Right? That way I didn't have to look at myself. That, you know, that was for years. That, fe that feeling inside of just utmost disgust of ourselves and, mo and feeling that the whole world, God, if they only knew the pain I was in you know, and the hurt I was in, they'd be embarrassed. You know? uh, that part keeps us sick. So we're going to have one more question I'm going to pose to the group before we move on to questions for the audience. But uh, I'll share uh, something that I think may be of value. And that's what I try very hard when I'm moving somebody from a position of denial is to understand how their behavior and their choices actually make sense. They may be illogical, but they may...